I'm going to talk in the next 40 minutes or so about some, some biblical principles, some theological truths about stewardship, and then after the break to come back and try to talk about some ways in which we can put those principles into practice in some practical principles for our, for our own congregations. Let me make it very clear, though I would have said this even before the bishop had to leave, that we are not here today to raise money for the diocesan budget. We are not in the fundraising business, and you may relax at that notion. The, the downside of that is that we're not here to raise money for your church budget either. And if anyone needs to leave now, that's, that's all right. Uh, if you came here because the roof was, was leaking, well, I think, though, you will find the day productive. Because it's our conviction that if the focus is on commitment to Jesus Christ, the dollars will take care of themselves. And I think that that is probably the most important principle in what we're about here. Our focus is on our commitment, and as the bishop said, our trust of the Lord, and trying to find ways that we can live that out day in and day out, ways that we can implement the, the need for education in our parishes that don't in fact undermine the theology that we have, things that, that put into practice our faith in Jesus Christ and don't subvert it. So I want to get right at it. I want to talk in the first session about some biblical principles and some basic understandings of, of Christian stewardship. And I'll give you some biblical references and read them to you. You might want to, to take them down and look them up later at, at your leisure. Is there anything we can do about Van Halen? <laughs> <laughs> That's the, the children rehearsing upstairs, so we're, we, will, we will have both going on. First is Deuteronomy 8, 17 and 18. Moses is leading the people of Israel through the wilderness. They've come out of Egypt, they're in the wilderness, and they're on their way to the promised land. And they have, of course, been slaves and have had next to nothing by way of possessions. And Moses, speaking for God, is preparing the people of Israel for the prosperity that they are going to have once they cross over the Jordan River into the promised land, a prosperity they've never known before. And consequently, there's a great deal of stewardship teaching in the book of Deuteronomy as they anticipate dealing with, with wealth and possessions. And Moses, speaking for God, uh, looking ahead to their life in the promised land and the land of milk and honey, says, Beware lest you say in your heart, My might and the power of my hand have gotten me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth which as a biblical statement is probably as bald a contradiction of what we hear day in and day out in this culture as you could hope to find. Our society says, this is my money. I earned it. You know, the old fashioned way, I earned it. That therefore it is mine, it's private, it's none of your business, it's none of the church's business, and it's probably none of God's business because I worked hard for it. But Moses is trying to help us understand that the abilities that we have to earn the money that we have came from God. And therefore, what I earn as salary is based on talents that I have that were gifts to me from the Lord. And consequently, there is no cause for boasting. There's no cause for pride. It all comes back to God's gift to me. Or as Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians, chapter 4, verse 7. What have you that you did not receive? If you then received it, why do you boast as if it were not a gift? Why do we so brag, if you will, about our possessions? Or if we're too modest and polite to do that, why do we think we have greater worth if we have more things? And as you know, our culture even has come to the point of referring to what is your net worth? Not as a statement that you are of infinite worth because you have been redeemed by the Son of God, but a statement of what are your liquid or non-liquid assets? What have you got that you can sell? And how we've perverted the message. We try to keep money and faith separate. God says the two go together. 
Now, I was, I was lied to in seminary. I was taught in seminary that Episcopalians do not like to talk about money. And I've come to understand that that is untrue. Episcopalians love to talk about money, but not in church. <laughs> if you get Episcopalians at a cocktail party, they will love to talk and complain about the cost of living or this or that or the other. Did you know what they've done to the property taxes? But in church, no. We keep money and faith separate. But God says that our money decisions are spiritual decisions. What we do with our possessions affects our relationship with God. We try valiantly to keep God's hands off our pocketbooks. As some of you know, I, I love the, the illustration from medieval history of the tribes of Europe, who the Goths and Vandals and Visigoths and all of those groups, who were converted to Christianity through the missionary efforts of, of missions, missions who, missionaries who went forth to, to preach the gospel. And you might well understand that most Visigoths were not converted by uh, personal submission to the Lordship of Jesus Christ after a one-on-one -on -one encounter with a missionary. They were converted because the head Visigoth was converted and thereby declared the whole Visigoth nation to be Christian leaving the missionaries with a somewhat awkward liturgical exercise of trying to baptize 10,000 Visigoths at one shot. And so they would often say prayers of blessing over a river and have the whole army march through en masse for baptism. Now you might appreciate that the pre-baptismal preparation for such an exercise would be sketchy at best. <laughs> and their understanding of baptism was somewhat deficient. And they have a very primitive notion of baptism. They seem to think that what got wet got baptized. And so they would pull their, their swords and they'd hold their swords high out of the water and march through the river because they really believed that if they kept their fighting arm dry, then they wouldn't have to change the way they fought and waged war. If they kept their swords unbaptized, they wouldn't have to make any changes in their life. Their, their swords would become, would remain unchristian. Well, it's been my experience in the Episcopal Church that a whole lot of us have gone through the waters of baptism with wallets <laughs> <laughs> held high out of the water. That we, we seem to have this notion that if we got our checkbooks wet, if God really baptized our wallets, there'd have to be some changes made. So our, our first line of defense is to rule the subject of money out of the discussion when we come to church. And one of the loudest protests you'll probably hear as you embark in stewardship education in your congregation is, we shouldn't be talking about this. This is private. This is nothing to do with, with the business of the vestry. We shouldn't be having this discussion. Not at all. God says that money decisions are spiritual decisions. Now, the second step from that is that we are accountable to God for what we decide. He cares about the decisions that we make. If you look at Matthew 25, 14 to 30, the parable of the talents, the servants who are given five talents and two talents and one talent, and who come back, the five having been multiplied to ten, the two having been doubled to four, but the one who had one talent was fearful of the hard master and came back and said, I, because you are a hard master, I buried it in the ground and here is my one talent. And the message to him from the master is a hard one. That you wicked and slothful servant, you knew I reap where I have not sowed and gathered where I have not winnowed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers and at my coming I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has 10 talents. For to everyone who has will more be given and he will have abundance. But from him who has not, even what he has will be taken away and cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. There men will weep and gnash their teeth. It's a hard message. We are accountable before God for what we do with what he has entrusted to us. Our money decisions are spiritual decisions and our money decisions matter. Now we've resist that like the plague. 
we like to think that God may have given us all that we have, but that we have thereby become owners and that it is now ours, even if God gave it to us as a gift, it is now ours and we have no responsibility before God with what we do with it. But God hasn't transferred the title that we continue to be managers and not owners. We're accountable before him. There was a wonderful ad on television a while back in, in our area. Some of you may have, may have seen it. For all I know in this group, some of you may have been responsible for producing it. I have to be careful, <laughs> groups in, in my own diocese. But uh, it was an ad for one of our banks. And the ad was the, sh the, the lifetime of a little boy. And the ad starts with this little boy being delivered. And it's a very realistic delivery room scene. And the mother's there pushing, and the father's there all gowned up, and the doctors and nurses are all there. And this little boy is born. And he's held up. And the rest of the ad is a series of flash forwards of this little boy's life lived out under the care and concern and protection of the bank. <laughs> and they show, they hold up the little boy and they flash forward and you see this little guy pedaling down the street throwing newspapers on lawns. And obviously you're thinking, you know, he's earning his first few pennies, passbook savings account, right? And then back to the delivery room, same little boy, and he's going forward and he's going off to some very swank looking college, obviously provided for by the loans and management of, of the bank. Back to the delivery room. And then he and his very attractive wife are stepping across the threshold of what is supposed to be their first house and the mortgage department has come through some house. And back to the delivery room, back and forth, back and forth. And they finally come to the end of this ad and they show this very silver haired gentleman with his very attractive wife standing at the helm of their yacht, <laughs> sailing across the screen. And the tagline on this ad, I kid you not, this is a quote, is our philosophy at such and such a bank is that even though you came into this world with nothing, shows up the little boy, you shouldn't have to leave that way. <laughs> well, I was, I was, I learned it in Missouri, and Frank Foster, who did a stewardship workshop here many years ago, reminded us that there ain't no luggage racks on hearses. <laughs> we are. We are accountable before God for what we do with what he has, he has entrusted to us. But there are consequences in our relationship with him for the right use of what he has entrusted to us. You look at Luke 12, 32 to 34. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give alms. Provide yourselves with purses that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Giving brings us closer to God. God has given us what we have, and in doing so has given us a tangible way of drawing closer to him by how we handle this material thing of money and possessions. We are able to be closer to him as we give back to him. Jesus' message about, about money and possessions can be summarized in two points. He says on the one hand that money can be the greatest asset we have in our relationship with God. Money is the greatest thing we have to, to deepen our experience of him. He says, if you want to be close to him, look at how you handle your money. And we see it in stories like the widow with her two tiny copper coins. The woman who shows more love for God with her little tiny gift than is shown in all the superficial gifts of the wealthy. The good Samaritan, the one who stops by the side of the road and interrupts what I'm sure was a busy schedule. If you want a, a sermon uh, text for the stewardship of time and talent, there's one right there. He cares for the one who is lying and beaten by the side of the road and takes him to the inn and has him fed and bandaged and cared for at his expense. And Jesus says that what he has done is what it means to love your neighbor. 